Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, interesting title today. We're going to react to How Deep Islam Is by the channel Humble Believer. Researching Islam myself, I can confirm that Islam is indeed very deep, simplistic on the surface. It is about the worship of one God, Tawheed. However, if you really start digging deeper, you will see how deep the rabbit hole goes. It is absolutely amazing and I believe that Islam satisfies the simple mind, the intellectual mind, the philosophical mind and even the spiritual mind. All right guys, but with no further ado, let's have a look. Fakhruddin al-Razi said the reason that Allah has given us this complexity is because he gives several reasons but among them he says is had it all been spelled out black and white, no difficulties, we would have been like automatons. Of course. There would have been no diversity. There would only been one madhab, one way of doing things and everybody had to follow it. That's not human nature. Yeah, this basically describes the question of good and evil as well. Of course, why is there evil? Why do bad things happen? Otherwise, it would be paradise already. Or moreover, like he describes here, if we would all conform, then there would be no diversity and therefore we would be robots. We would be machines and not humans. We will never have all of humanity agreeing on any one thing. This reminds me as well of the Quran when the Quran states, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, that if God wanted us to have all the same belief, he would have willed it, but he willed it otherwise. Agreeing on any one thing. And, and so diversity is our nature. There are people that are strict, so there's all these hadith that suit those strict people. There are people that are lenient, there's all these other hadith that suit those lenient people. There are people that really like to be strict on themselves and on others. And there's all these hadith that they're going to find that are, they fit them perfectly. They seem to know all those hadith. They don't know any of the other hadith about leniency and being, but they know all those. That's the vastness of Islam. Is that, and then there's people that, that uh, uh, incline towards certain uh, things that don't incline towards other things. And it's all there in the Prophet ﷺ Sunnah. So he says that that vastness is the universality of Islam. And, and, and when you have a book that is nuanced, that is subtle, that is, can be interpreted on many different levels, it's going to encourage the universality. It's going to compliment okay. that aspect Fair of point. humanity. And At then the he same says, time, you have to say, of course, that Islam is one. There is no other Islam. There is only one Islam, right? But at the same time, he kind of points out that there are different interpretations of the same book. This for me is reminiscent of perennialism and the interfaith movement. Yet again, I often get this tone when I'm listening to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. What is he really saying here? That there is not one true Islam, but there are different interpretations? Please let me know what you think in the comment section. Another important aspect is that everybody wants to prove their point. So when they take a position about something in the Quran, they're going to work really hard to strengthen their position. So it forces a type of study. If everybody agreed on it, people wouldn't be studying. Like today, for the people that were sure. in my Madiki class, I was talking about the difference between the Sadal and the Qabal. If there wasn't a difference of opinion, everybody would just be doing this and nobody would know why they're doing it other than that's what everybody does. But of because course. there's a difference of opinion, it forces you to look at the hadith, it forces you to know the people that had this opinion, why they had that opinion, and then what their delil was and why. And so it creates a type of, of intellectual uh, engagement with the tradition that would not otherwise exist, which is very important. I mean, one of the things, people tell me all the time, Muslims are always arguing over stupid things, like the moon sighting. Every year we have this argument, why can't we just work it out? Well, it is amazing that we are an ummah that still cares about these things that much to where they're actually important. 
Because a lot of religions don't even care about these things anymore, and they're like, who cares? What's yep. the big deal? That's correct. And they that's their the attitude towards their religion. The but for Muslims, they do care. Mm. They want to do the right thing, and there's different opinions about what the right thing is, and they get passionate about it. Now, sometimes they become overzealous, and that's a problem. But better in some ways to be overzealous than to be dead spiritually as a community, to not have any uh, real zeal about your faith or your religion. Yeah, so right, I don't think that's a negative about the Muslims. What we're lacking is civil society. What we're lacking is adab al ikhtilaf. And one could argue that we've never had it universally in the Muslim Ummah. I'll give you a few examples just to point this out. Imam uh, At-Tabari, his house was stoned by students of the Hanbali Madrasa in Iraq when he was teaching because he didn't consider Ahmad a faqih. They went and stoned his house. Imam al-Nasai was stomped to death wow. by uh, one of the greatest muhaddithin in Muslim history. He was literally stomped to death in a masjid. So it's not like masjid. there hasn't been these terrible things that have happened in our history. There are. There have been terrible things. And you'll find the these in all man. religious traditions. When you get fanatics, when you get idiots, when you get knuckleheads that have no other way you know, of, of understanding something except their limited way. You know, this 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 provincial attitude and that somehow it's my religious duty to stomp out any other way of viewing it literally uh, it's a problem religion becomes poisonous as far as I'm concerned it actually becomes a, a source of human suffering as opposed to a source of human enlightenment of actually elevating people's state yeah it's a fine line of course because on the one hand you have some zealous idiots that interpret the scripture a certain way but then yet again it doesn't mean that if you interpret it more liberal therefore it will become correct i'm not saying that this is what he says here however i'm getting this impression point of the story is the question always has to be what is the true Islam? And if there is a true Islam, which we of course have to expect, then how do we obey that true Islam? No? And them closer to God. It actually, it, it distances them from God. They become harsh, hard-hearted. And that's why immediately after this verse, first of all, it warns us about people. Whenever you find people that are interested in, you know, these verses in the Quran that are hazy, and they want you to make sure you know that they mean exactly what they say they mean. In other words, that they're muhkamat. The first thing, know that they're from the people of fitna, that Allah warns against, and that they have deviation in their hearts, they have zayr in their hearts. But the second thing, know that they don't have intellect. Because Allah praises the people of intellect at the end of those verses saying that the people that really understand this are people of intellect because they know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says istawa al arsh you know that he he's a, a, upon a throne that they know by their intellect that it is absolutely inconceivable for the infinite creator of the heavens and the earth to be limited by time or space Yes. To be mahmul, to be carried on anything. That, they know that. I absolutely but they're agree. Not gonna I have to agree, of course, because we're talking about the necessary being. We're talking about a God that is transcendent of time and space. And now we're talking about a throne. How can that throne be literal? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yet again, with all due respect, but this is my thought pattern. If you intellectually rationalize your way to a necessary being that exists without time and space, Time and space, thrones, chairs, hands, faces, all of this only exists within time and space. And therefore, to really believe that God sits on a throne, that would be already limiting God. Deny that verse because that verse is there. So they say we believe in it, but, but, and we know it doesn't mean what it appears to mean because with God there is no how. Okay. And this is what Imam Malik, when he was asked, Kifar istiwa, how did, how did God uh, istawa, which in, in Arabic can mean to sit. So he asked, how did God do this istiwa? And Imam Malik said, al-istiwa 
ma'loom. The istiwa is known. In other words, that it, it's in the Quran. Well, kayfa ghayru ma'qul. And the how is completely irrational. It's inconceivable. And in a riwayah majhul, it's, you know, it's just, it's not something you could ever know what that means. And then he said, وَالسُؤَالُ عَنْهُ bid'ah, And to ask about it is a bid'ah. It's an innovation. Because none of the salaf asked about it. That, that was Imam Malik's position. So these, the only reason I'm focusing on this is because this is a problem in our time. That's the only reason. I, I, I would pass over these a lot quicker, but you need to understand that there are people out there that are presenting a position and they're saying this is the position of the first community and it's not. It's but a deviant you know? position. And they can call us... But now he makes an absolute claim, of course, and he says that this is the deviant position. But why? What is the arguing for that? He, of course, indirectly claims that therefore his position must be the correct one if he disqualifies the other position. It's deviant. I, that's fine. You know. Allah says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to settle this on the Day of Judgment. So, you're a deviant, I'm a deviant, fine. We'll wait. Let's just act civilly towards each other. I'm going to pray next to you in the masjid, I'll break my Ramadan fast with you, I'll say salamu alaykum, and we'll be friends. You're a deviant, I'm a deviant. But on Yom Qiyamah, we'll see who the deviant is. And I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait. But if defending God's vastness is deviancy, I'm willing to be a deviant. Alright guys, this is it for today's video. Hamza Youssef is always a bit too emotional for me personally and moreover you can't really put your finger on him. You can't really say okay this is what he's about. He is slippery. He says okay well then we are both deviants. <laughs> this is a non-confrontational approach of course but indirectly he claims of course that his position is the correct one. He truly believes that you cannot yet again put your finger on God. God's vastness. If you have a more literal approach, if you look into the Salafi school, for example, from what I found out so far, it is a more literalistic approach. So therefore, if the Quran says Allah has a hand, Allah has a face, Allah has a throne, etc., etc., then this is what it is, and we're not gonna question it. However, he of course questions it and he uses his intellect to further understand God for himself. And yet again, I can truly understand his approach approach here because I make the argument as well that a transcendent God cannot sit whatsoever. There is no sitting. God is not limited like we are with legs and with a behind of course for him to sit on a throne. This becomes a metaphor of course that we cannot fully understand. The only way that I would look at it is that God is above everything, sitting above everything like a king, symbolically above everything else but not like a creature that is constrained to its body sitting on some Thing. An all transcending God. Our existence is contingent upon His pure existence. This God cannot be limited to any physical imagination. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. Let me know in the comment section what you think about it. And if you like the video, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys, as always. May God bless you all, much love and peace.